Last week, I spoke to you out of Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And I want to stay in Jeremiah for just a little bit. I spoke to you about the importance of knowing what God thinks. Amen? And this is what God said in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's why we pray for our youngsters. I explain that, and we pray for our teachers, because they were born just as we were, with a future and a hope in the thoughts and the mind of God. God knew us before we were. Go figure. He knit us in our mother's womb. Go figure. How did he do it? The way he designed it. Amen? Amen. Eggs and seeds. Nothing's changed. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, chapter 33. In my Bible, I have a, a life application note, and, and my notes say this, and I quote this to you. We're all encouraged by a leader who stirs us to move ahead. Someone who believes we can do the task he's given and who will be with us all the way. God is that kind of leader. He knows the future, and his plans for us are good and full of hope. As long as God, who knows the future, provides our agenda and goes with us as we fulfill his mission, we can have boundless hope. This does not mean that we will be spared pain, spared suffering, or spared hardship, but that God will see us through to a glorious conclusion. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, yip, yip, yahoo. <laughs> it's a glorious conclusion. Amen. Amen. Now, Father God has said that He desires us to live an abundant life. Amen? A life of boundless hope. A life of, 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 of richness. A, a life that has a, a, a rich future in it. But as the notes I just read to you stated, it doesn't mean that we're going to be spared. That we're going to be spared pain. That we're going to be spared trials and suffering and hardships. But that God in them all will see us through. Psalm 23. Amen. He will see us through. This morning I want to I want to continue in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, and I want to read verse um, 1 through 3. Father, your word, not mine, is rich in its fullness. And Father, as we read and, and hear of your word this morning, Lord God, we just pray that you would work something in our hearts, that you would stir us somehow, give us some kind of insight, some kind of knowledge, some, some kind of enlightenment this morning, Lord God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit in us, bingo, man, we, we heard something. We got something we can take home. Father, we just thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we give you all the glory, and we praise your holy name. Amen. 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 Jeremiah 33, 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the, in, in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about, about the city that had been torn down. He said, The Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it, the Lord who established it, the Lord is his name. He says this, he says, call to me, call to me, call to me. Don't call to your neighbors down the road. Don't call to the city five miles down to come back. Don't call 911. Don't call the Forest Service. Don't call the whatever letters they have. Don't call Pastor Jack. <laughs> unless he tells you to. He says, call to me, and I will what? I'll answer you. He said, call to me. I'll answer you. Call to me. I will answer you, he said, and I'll show you great and mighty things which you do not know. He wants to see the power 
that rests in him active in our lives. He really does. He wants to show his kids off to the world. He wants to, to show the world how you go through suffering. He wants to show the world how you make it through trials. He wants to show the world how you make this trip of life and how you do it abundantly. How you do it successfully. How do you, how you do it victoriously. Amen? You with me? Yes, sir. See, God is trying, God was trying to restore Jerusalem and not because His people were weeping and crying. They were weeping and crying. But, but God, that didn't stir God's heart. That isn't why God said, I'm going to restore Jerusalem. God said, I'm going to restore Jerusalem because it's part of my plan. I love you guys. I love you lots. But I got a plan. You need to praise God that we're in His plan. Amen? We need to praise Him for that. It was part of His plan. We could look at, look at the, ba the Babylonian disaster did not change God's purposes for Israel. The Babylonians did not take Israel captive and God went, oh, gee whiz. <laughs> Angels, did, we did not see that coming. What am I going to do now? No, God looked down and said, according to plan. According to plan. I knew this was coming. Jerusalem was, was destroyed, but it would be restored. And restored by the wonder-working, wonder miracle-working power of God. Yes, the people came in. They, yes, they had to do work. They had to set stones. They had to realign walls. They had to build the wall. But God, God did it by His power. Were it not for His power, they would never be there. Amen? Amen. Were it not for the power of God, there wouldn't even be stones to build the wall with. Jerusalem was... Let me ask you, do you believe this morning... Do you believe this morning that if circumstances, if, if, if the Babylonian captivity could not change God's plans for Jerusalem and His people, do you believe that circumstances cannot change your life? Ooh, that's pretty quiet. I only got three of those. See, we've got to see past the circumstances, people. Circumstances do not change God's plan for us. Are we good with that this morning? Circumstances do not change God's plan. No matter the circumstance, no matter the trial, no matter the tribulation, no matter the issue before us, it does not change God's plan plan. The things that we go through in our lives brought us to the place of where we are today. They, they made us who we are. I, I don't know why God did those things. I, I don't know why, why you know, you got to take a thumping in the eighth grade from five guys. I don't know why you have to do that. But evidently it happens. And evidently it works within one's life. First thing it did, make you mean, but God can change that. Amen? God can change that. But the things that take place in our lives, we have to see them for what they are. Working power in our lives. God can change what He needs to change. And He can do what He needs to do. When you and I gave our lives to Jesus, we said, take this body... Take this soul, take this man, take this woman, and do whatever you want with it. Is that right? Uh-oh. <laughs> then we have to believe that God took us up on it. Amen? We got to believe that He took us up on it, that we are... We are all things are proceeding according to plan. Yuck. Sometimes just yuck. But God is teaching. God is growing. God is ministering. God is moving. And what is it if God wants to use my body as a proof to the world 
that his hand exists, then it's mine to serve him. I don't know what that might look like. I don't know. But how many people have come to the Lord because someone lost a leg in an accident and witnessed the, the power and wonder-working power of God in his life because he was okay? Without a leg, he was trusting God. How many, how many people come to the Lord by watching and seeing God at work in your life and my life? Or not at work. When we grumble, spit, complain, kick cans down the road, walk around with sourpuss faces, I just ate a plate load of persimmons. Circumstances cannot change God's plan. Everybody say it with me. Circumstances cannot change God's plan for me. And write it on your refrigerator, write it on the wall of your bathroom, write it somewhere. Jeremiah 33, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah that second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison. He is in the court of the prison and God's talking to him. Amen? Amen. Thus saith the Lord who made it, Jerusalem, the nation. I made it. The Lord who formed it. That's me. The Lord is his name. That's my name. Jeremiah, can you hear me? Call to me. And I will answer. It's really that simple. That's why Jesus said, bring the kids here. They get this. I, I, can, talk, I can talk to them. They, they understand this. He said, I, I, I'll answer and I'll show you. I'll show you stuff you've never thought of, you've never seen, you've never. You know, I, can show you, I can show you stuff. I'll show you a way out through an iron door. I'll show you a way to break down what the enemy, to, to build back up what the enemy has broken down in your life. I can show you how to do that. And I can supply the power. And I can supply the need. And I can make that happen in you. Do you belong to me or do you not? When we, when we look at certain situations in our lives and, and measure it by our own ability and our own understanding, that, that, that's when unbelief rises up in us. Because We've looked at things in our lives that were just monsters. They were just huge. And we're, we're scrambling in our minds, how do I work my way out of this? What, what, what do I have to sell that I can pay this, this PG&E bill? What, 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 how do I scramble? How do, how do I make... And, 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 and faith begins to erode within our chest. Unbelief rises up. Our own abilities take a lead on the faith that God gave us. Quiet. How many of us have faced a problem or a need that we just couldn't figure our way out of? Oh, amen. Well, we tried, didn't we? Amen. How many still have that problem? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's kind, of, it's kind of human nature for some folks that whatever happens in life, they, they just wait it out, you know. They, they just, they, you, you hear a thump in the night and you pull the covers over your head, you know. Maybe it'll go away. Listen, if it's there for you, it ain't going away. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. And we hear the footsteps and fear builds up within our mind, within our heart, and our our, our soul starts blowing it up bigger than it is. Amen. Some people are just, well, whatever happens, it's okay. Um, you know, it is what it is. I'll, I'll, I'll just go with it, you know. Well, I told you before, it is what it is but Jesus. Amen. Amen? It is what it is but Jesus. Somebody tells you, well, it is what it is. Just tell them but Jesus. That can change, amen? 
The power of God's word and his promises to us are not made so that we can live a life of mediocrity. Thank you, Sister Denny. Amen. It's not, it's, not a, it's not about mediocrity. They are made to us to assure us of his abundance and our abundant lives. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief doesn't come except to steal, to kill, to destroy. And he said, but I have come to what? To give life and it's so quiet. Can we read that? Is that big enough? The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, destroy, and I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cotton picking, hallelujah. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. God, God's telling Jeremiah, in effect, you should have called me sooner, bro. He didn't have to go through all this. You know, if you call to me, I'll answer. He did. There was a time when the disciples couldn't cast a demon out of a boy. Remember that? What did Jesus say? Je so Matthew 17, 20. I'll tell you what Jesus said. He said, because of your unbelief. For I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting? Faith of a mustard seed. It can't go out unless you're in contact with the giver and the maker of that faith. He gave it to you. He put that within you. Faith is a mustard seed. The kind of faith to move mountains. I hear Jesus saying, you know what, guys? If you guys had been praying and fasting instead of scrambling in all your little emergencies, you would have had a mustard seed of faith within you that would rise up in that instance and not cower, not back away, but would rise up and stand in the face of adversity, no matter what the adversity is, and you would have won this thing. Because that prayer and that fasting builds you up into the warrior that I desire you to be. You've got to hear from me, God says. You don't hear from me, you got nothing. You've got to hear from me. John Corson says this, and this is so good. I read this from him. He says, prayer attaches us to God. Fasting detaches us from the flesh. Let me say that again. Prayer attaches us to God. Fasting detaches us from the flesh. I passed out some mustard seeds a while back. You remember how small they were? You know, smaller than one of those little tiny, you know those little tiny mosquitoes? You know how much they can move you? A little, a little bitty, tiny. You move, you change chairs. You, you, you swat. You, I mean, it can move you all over the place. Well, that mustard seed of faith can do the same thing. It can move a mountain. It can move a mountain. Oh, my gosh. You get this. A little mosquito-sized faith will do the same thing to our mountain if it is applied as Jesus has asked. Amen. If we use it believing and trusting that in it Jesus will do what He said He would do when He said He would do it. Wow. Woo. I can hear someone say, well, yeah, Pastor, but, 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 Do we trust Jesus and what He said? Do we trust everything Jesus said? Because let me tell you something. If you can't trust everything Jesus said, 
Can you trust anything? If you can't trust everything that Jesus said, what can you trust? There, there isn't anything for you to put a foot on. Because it all comes up for debate. It all, it all comes up to be challenged by our own mind, our own thinking, our own imaginings. All of a sudden we think, yeah, Jesus said, but. Yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. I, you know, I guess not much we can do. If you're telling me there's not much we can do, it's because you're thinking about what you can do. Amen. Amen. That's cold, Pastor. Yes, it is. This is real. God isn't asking us. Listen. God isn't asking us to do the impossible because He's already put the possible in us. God will never ask you to do what you can't do. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're all ready for whatever He asks you. You're ready. He's empowered you. It's there. Amen? Amen. God has dealt to each one, Romans 12, 3, a measure of faith. Everyone. Everybody in here. Y'all got it. It's on you, in you, around you. And I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times it's trying to get out of me and I'm holding it back. Because I can do stuff. I'm good at it. Y'all see me scramble. I can come up with stuff to sell so I can get that goodie I want. I tell, oh, I asked God one time, could I have a 35 Ford pickup? And he said, yeah. And so, man, I sold a horse. I sold stuff. I got rid of stuff. I finally found that 35, and I had it. And it was the biggest millstone <laughs> around my neck. And I said, God, I asked you if I could have a 35 Ford pickup. And you said yes. He said, yes, I did. But I didn't say I was paying for it. <laughs> huh? You got to watch God, man. He's, he, will, he will put it on you. He will put it on you, man. Every time I ask now, and he says, yes, I ask him, are you buying? <laughs> are you buying? Because I know I can't afford it, what I just asked for. Uh, what do we expect to see in our walk of faith? What do you think it's going to look like? What do, you, what do you think your walk of faith is going to look like? What does your future look like to you? Because what you look for is what you will see. Some of you may know Tom Dorrance, horse whisperer. Tremendous, tremendous horseman. I took, a, I took a team of mules to him one time. I had a team of mules that I was using for a ministry uh, with a chuck wagon. And I was having problems with Moses, Moses and Aaron. And I was having problems with Moses, and God said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I called Tom Dorrance. I said, Tom, I, I just, I got, I've had guys look at this mule. I, I don't know what to do. And Tom says, why don't you bring him over, Jack? So I did. All we did, Denny was with me. All, all I did was, was lead them off the trailer. And he said, well, go ahead and tie that one up. This is the one we've got to work with him. What? How do you know that? And so he worked with that mule, and you know what? He got him through some real serious stuff. We couldn't get him next to wheelchairs. We had kids in wheelchairs and stuff. And so he, he worked with him, and by golly, he became, he became the mule that God wanted him to be. But, get to the point of my story, I was standing there with him in 110 degree heat, 105, 110, up on the west side, 
And it was so hot. It was so hot, we were standing under the shade of a pepper tree. You all know what a pepper tree is? Big, broomy kind of tree. And it was, you know, seven feet underneath it. Old tree. And Tom looked at me and he said, he said, Jack, this here's a money tree. And I looked up at it. I go, man, it sure is. I'll tell you what, it's worth a million dollars in this 110 degree heat, you know. And, and we kept on talking, and he stopped again. He said, Jack, he said, this is a money tree. And I'm going, can we talk about this already? And I go, yeah, yeah, I know it is. And he said, Jack, look at me. This is a money tree. And when he said that, all the leaves turned into pieces of scotch tape with nickels and pennies and dimes hanging under them, all under this tree. I couldn't see any of them because I wasn't looking for nickels and dimes and pennies. I was looking for pepper tree leaves, and that's what I saw. The point he was making, and it was such a point, is that you are only going to see what you expect to see. And so if you're not looking for the miracle, for the miracle of God in your life, you, you won't see it when it happens. If you're looking for God's direction in your life, His hand to move and, 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 to, and to turn you, you're not going to see it unless you're looking for it. Amen? We good? We good? Was that an illustration? Can you use that? You're only going to see what you're looking for. What is that faith inside of you driving you to see? Or what is that doubt in you driving you to see? Whew. What I'm saying, friends, we look for doom and gloom and incomplete. We're going to see doom and gloom and incomplete. Amen? But if we're looking for our needs to be met by God, our mountains to be moved by God, then we're going to see needs met and mountains moved. Amen? I'm telling you, attach that seed of faith into belief with Jesus Christ and watch your world explode. Watch it explode. You're going to pray for people and they're going to get healed. You're going to see them right in the middle of Walmart. You're going to walk right up to them and say, oh, you look down, can I, can I help you today? I, can I pray for you? Hey, they may say, no, go away from me. Praise God. Okay. Or they may say, yes, pray for me. And you watch when you pray if God doesn't move. Why? Because he wants to show off his power in his kids. And he's willing to do it any time, any place. The lame, the blind, even the crazy came to Jesus with a mustard seed of faith. Come on, they all did. They didn't know Jesus. They just heard about Jesus. How much faith can you have in someone you just heard about? Oh, man. Not much. But that woman came to him with an issue of blood for years and years, broke, dead, penniless, tried everything she could, huh? Tried everything she could, and then she heard there might there might be something more for me. And that faith built up in her enough to push through a crowd that she shouldn't even be in. She could be stoned dead for being in the midst of them and crawled her way through to touch Jesus, to touch the hem of his garment and her faith. That mustard seed healed him. Amen. Amen. Some of us, I'll tell you what, we got a cut on us. We need a mustard pack. We, we don't even need a little seed. We need some big faith. Amen. We got to grow it. Amen. I don't even know if those people were nice people that came to Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they accepted him as Lord and Savior or they just 
sought the miracle from the man called Jesus? I don't know. But they had enough in them. They had enough mustard in them to make them rise and go to the one who had the power. The one in whom all of the possibilities resided. And they took themselves and put him and placed themselves and positioned themselves for a miracle. Some of us wonder, God, well, God why? Why aren't you helping me in this? And God said, why don't you stand still? I know you got issues with the bank. I was down at the bank. I don't know what you were doing. You're out. Are you with me here? See, God wants us with him. Union, communion, relationship. Amen? This is a relational thing we have here. Us and Jesus. Us and God. Us and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not religion. It's relationship. Does that relationship become religion? Yes, it can. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. But it's relationship. And that's what this is all about this morning. This is what Jeremiah had to, had to get his, his head wrapped around. God said, Jeremiah, you got to call out to me. You're calling out to everything else. Look at you. You're prison. Come on, man. Call to me. I'll give you the answers. Look at all those people that were healed. Was one, was one issue, one was blind, one could hear, one was crazy, one was, was bleeding for 12 years. Was one worse than the other? I think if you would ask any one of them, they'd have said, I got a mountain. Amen? Jesus didn't say it depends on the size of the mountain. What did he say it depended on the size of? The faith. And he said, a mustard seed of faith is enough. And that's the portion that you have been given. Wow. i got to wrap this up. I offer you this. I came across this story, and it's a great illustration of what I'm trying to share here this morning. So once, there was an old hermit who lived on a mountain. And three little boys were always trying to outsmart this guy. One of the little boys said, I'll put a marble in my hand, and we'll go to the old man and ask him, what do I have in my hand? So the three boys went and visited and said, what do I have in my hand? And he said, a marble. And the three boys scratched their heads, they left, and they came back with another trick. And the boys' astonishment, to their astonishment, the man told them what the answer to the question was. The next day, the boys were pondering this situation, trying to come up with something so ingenious that the old man would never guess the answer. One of the boys said, I know, I know, I know. I'll put a baby bird in my hand. And I'll ask the old man if the bird is alive or dead. And if he says dead, if he says alive, I'll crush it in my hand and outsmart the old man. So with smiles on their faces, cocky attitudes, I would suggest, they went to the old hermit's house, and the little boy said, Old man, what have I in my hand? And the old man answered, A baby bird. And the boy said, Is the bird alive? Or is the bird dead? And the old man looked at the little boy, and he said, It's as you wish, young man. It's as you wish. And the fate of that little bird rested in the boy's hands. Listen, the fate of our needs. Listen, the fate of our need also rests in our hands. What do we say it's going to be? When we come asking God for our needs to be met, He asks us, what have you in your heart? What have you in your heart? Is it alive or dead? What have you in your heart? Because it's, it's as you say. Our, only, our, our answer should only be what you gave me. <laughs> what you gave me is in my hand. That's all I got. That's all I got. 
a measure of faith to believe what you said you would do for me, and a measure of faith big enough to believe that your grace is sufficient. And God will say, my child, that is more than enough. If you've got a need this morning, I encourage you to offer. Would you come help me out here, sister? If you've got a need this morning, I encourage you to offer God what you already have. You may think it's a little piece of nothing. There was someone one time who said, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And that's okay too. If you've got a need in your life today, just come with what you've got. Come with what God has given you. Amen?